Hello, and welcome back to From My Mom's Basement. I'm your host, David Chamberlain, and this is episode 27 of the podcast, titled A Little Detour, written by myself. Thank you all for listening. They'd only been married three months when he died. The moment the phone rang that night, she knew something was wrong. It was too early. He wasn't supposed to land for another couple hours. That's when she got the news. Her husband's flight had taken a little detour, a detour that left many people injured and a few people dead. Her husband was among the few. They were still in the midst of writing thank you letters to wedding guests and unpacking flatware and hanging up picture frames. Hell, they even had a few wedding presents left to unwrap. They were still caught up in that whirlwind of newlywed excitement. Everything was fresh. Even their house smelled like new paint. Cardboard boxes huddled in corners and lined the hallways. Everything pointed towards the future. They were just getting started. She was still getting used to coming home to him every night. He'd be on the couch, his hairy feet hanging over the edge of the sofa cushions, and he'd smile and say, There she is. How was it today? She was still getting used to the obsidian black coffee he liked to drink every morning, the kind that tasted like volcanic ash and smelled like campfire smoke. She was still getting used to feeling his body at night, the contours of his torso, the texture of his skin, the smells, the warmth. She was still getting used to living with the person she loved more than herself. These new things were so exciting for her, the unfamiliarity of it all the constant discovery of hidden idiosyncrasies, that she wished she'd never become too accustomed to them. She wished that these things would stay new and cloaked in mystery forever. She was afraid of becoming bored with her new life. She was afraid of becoming too familiar. Now, she'd never have to worry about that fear coming to fruition. Now she was afraid of forgetting. Now she was afraid of losing any and all familiarity. She was afraid that one day she might forget her groom's name, or the way his voice sounded when he was frustrated, or the way his lips curled when he smiled. These were the fears she had now. The kind of fears that nothing can quell or alleviate. These are the things grief is made of. When she first got the news, she, as you might have guessed, didn't believe it. She exhausted the whole gambit of cliché lines. You've made a mistake. You're kidding. This isn't funny. Are you sure you got the right flight number? And so on, and so on. It really wasn't until her groom's body was laid in front of her that she believed he was dead. She identified his body along with her mother-in-law, a woman she loved very much and who, by rights, should have made everything about herself, but instead only ever consoled the young bride and focused all of her love on her. That day they identified him. The groom's mother remarked that her son looked very handsome, even in death. The bride agreed, of course, and then cried. Her mother-in-law took her in her arms and said something the bride would never forget. We must go back to the simple things now. We must take our lives back to the utmost simplicity. We must remember to eat and to drink water. And to brush our teeth. And maybe, maybe if we do these things, we just might be able to make it. The days that followed were very wretched days for the bride. Oblique, gray, never-ending days that dissolved into the next day without any kind of distinction. Sleep was rare and often only afforded through medication. The new house that once held promise and possibility now felt empty and malevolent. Everything looked lopsided and strange, as if taken from an evil cartoon world. The new furniture, the king-sized bed, and the photos on the walls all became vicious insults, indictments against the bride. These things were artifacts belonging to a life she once had, which she could never return to. The day of the funeral came, and was very sad. There was something criminally unnatural about having so many people, many far older than the groom, look down on a young, handsome corpse. 
He was supposed to have gray hair, the bride thought. He was supposed to be wrinkly and ugly and gross and decaying. He was supposed to die of liver failure 60 years from now, she thought. She stood in the corner of the funeral parlor and pretended she didn't exist. She couldn't look at him, not while he was lying in a casket, his cheeks bloated with weird preservation chemicals. She'd never forgive herself for that, for not looking at his face one last time. After the groom's body was put underground, a luncheon was held at the mother-in-law's house. Here the bride locked herself in a bathroom and sat on the toilet in her shiny black dress and listened to the murmuring of funeral goers on the other side of the door. She bemoaned the fact that out of all the times she would need her husband for support, his death was the one time she couldn't have it. The funeral ended with the bride's mother-in-law throwing away paper plates and cleaning serving trays. How her mother-in-law could wash dishes instead of running around outside screaming until her vocal cords ruptured and fire shot from her eyes, the bride couldn't know. At least you're beautiful, the mother-in-law said, her head bowing over the kitchen sink. Some people have to go through this sort of thing and are ugly, too. On the days she had the strength to get out of the house, the bride would drive in endless loops around her city her eyes unfocused, and her destination never clear. Sometimes she could find the energy to get some fast food or maybe some groceries, but most of the time she couldn't. When she came to an intersection, the bride would look at the cars beside her and stare at the people within them and think, Do they know? Do they know they're all one step away from tragedy? It's coming for them right now. Once, while on one of these meandering drives, the bride glimpsed a young woman washing her car at a self-service car wash. The young woman was very pretty and was singing along with her car radio. She even danced a little, power washer in hand. The bride, overtaken by some kind of emotion she couldn't understand, but one which took control of her and made her stomach drop out of her pelvis as if she were giving birth to a dark, oily waterfall, pulled her car into the parking lot of the car wash, parked her car, and sat staring at this young woman. For a brief moment, the bride thought of unbuckling her seatbelt, bursting out of her car, running to the young woman, grabbing her by the shoulders, and asking her to please, please be grateful for her health and her life and for everything else that made her happy enough to dance and sing along with her car radio. The young woman caught the bride staring and waved to the bride as if to an old friend. Feeling both humiliated and wretched, the bride snapped her eyes away, threw her car back into gear, and peeled out of the car wash parking lot. After these days came the worst days, the days when the bride punished herself for feeling the slightest bit better, the least bit healthier. She couldn't let herself heal. What would that mean if she no longer hurt, if she no longer cried all night? Would that mean she didn't love her groom anymore? Would that mean she was forgetting him? Would that mean their love wasn't forever? She hated herself for beginning to heal. She didn't want to let go. She didn't want to lose her pain because that was the only piece of him she had left. It was her groom's substitution, a companion she'd grown used to and clung to like a life preserver. After a time, she realized she couldn't live in her house anymore. The groom's fingerprints were all over it. His beard trimmings somehow kept showing up in the bathroom sink and his smell still lingered in certain locations, namely the couch and the bed. Sometimes the smell would catch her off guard and send her spiraling into a disorienting gallery of memories. Or, even worse, she'd smell him and turn around expecting to see him standing there, or lying there, wearing his usual dopey smile. Yes, if she were serious about living, about this whole moving on business, she'd have to move out of the house. It would be the only way to keep from losing herself to depression or insanity, or maybe a little bit of both. Arrangements were made, and she put the house on the market, repacking her things into the very same boxes she emptied only weeks before. There was the problem of what to do with all of her groom's belongings. At first, she wanted to keep it all, everything down to his crumpled tube of Colgate and his brutalized dress socks. She would keep these things as tokens, as ways to not forget. But soon these things became less comforting and more, like, radioactive. 
the bride felt sick on contact with these things, as if her groom had left a residue, something poisonous and foul, over all the things he once owned. An entire day of hers could be ruined just by making contact with one of said items. The day the bride took his running shoes from the closet to the garage, she incurred some acute radiation poisoning, a sickness so head-thumping and stomach-gouging she couldn't move the rest of the day. She just lied on the couch and marveled at the fact that his sneakers still smelled bad, still smelled like his stinky, hairy feet. How can a smell outlive a person? She wondered. When she finally worked up the courage, the bride started to sell off the groom's things, or else give them to charity. His family helped her with the bigger stuff. Her nephew took his car, a 2008 Acura, and her mother-in-law took most of his photos and personal items, the things the bride could barely stand to look at. One day you might want some of these things, her mother-in-law said. I'll hold on to them. But as for the wedding rings, the bride held on to those. She wore both her engagement ring and her wedding band every day. She had never taken them off, and she didn't know when she'd be ready to, if ever. Her empty house became emptier still. The echoes grew more pronounced, and her thoughts grew even louder. Her plan was to move out of the city, to go someplace her groom had never set foot in. It would be hard. Her support system would be far away but she knew the reprieve she'd feel from not being a block away from her groom's office building or his favorite restaurant or the park where they had their first date would be worth the comparably trivial difficulty of moving. She found an apartment in a satellite city, a kind of small tributary to her hometown, and signed a lease. The day before she was set to leave, the bride's mother-in-law came over to say goodbye. They took tea on the back patio of the house, whose sale had just been finalized. Another young couple was ready to move in at the end of the month. They had just tied the knot. Go figure. It was a pleasant day for tea on the patio, one of those sunny days that were so serene it felt like an affront to the bride's grief. The two women sat on the patio in vinyl chairs and sipped their tea and didn't say anything for a long time. Finally, the bride said, He was going to put in a garden over there. Where? The mother-in-law asked. Over in the corner there? The bride said, pointing. Oh, the mother-in-law said, nodding and setting her teacup down. That would have been very nice. What did he, what did he want to plant? Sorry? What did he want to plant? Oh, um, tomatoes, I think. Um, and I think bell peppers. That would have been nice. Yeah, it would have been very nice, the mother-in-law said again. How do you like your tea? The bride asked. Oh, it's very good. Tasty. The bride nodded. Good. So you're all ready to go, huh? The mother-in-law asked. The bride nodded. Yes. Was the was that U-Haul a pain to get a hold of? Oh no, no, it was it was okay. Wasn't too expensive, was it? The bride shook her head. No, not too bad. And and I can drop it off at the place they have there. I don't have to drive it back here, so that's nice. Oh well. Yeah, that is that is nice, the mother in law said, looking out at the backyard. You can call me if you need anything, if you ever have any, any trouble. The bride felt a lump swelling in her throat. Yeah, I, I know. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Now the bride could feel the tears coming. She clenched her teeth and put her hand over her mouth. There was another long silence. Birds sang somewhere overhead, and the trees swung blotchy shadows over the patio. Marlene? The bride said, Yes? What am I supposed to do now? The mother-in-law looked at her daughter-in-law and frowned and shook her head. Oh, if I knew, if I knew, I'd tell you. You just have to keep doing what you've been doing. You have to keep moving forward. But, 
but what if I don't want to? Oh, sweetheart, the mother-in-law said, you can't talk that way. I don't want to move on. I don't want to forget him. The mother-in-law smiled. How could you possibly forget him? I wanted so many things, the bride said. I wanted to have a family, and you'll have one someday, the mother-in-law said. The bride's eyes widened as if her mother-in-law had just said something profoundly offensive. I'll never have a family. He was it for me. He was it. I can't even entertain the idea of being with someone else. It makes me, it makes me want to. The bride trailed off, shaking her head in disgust. The mother-in-law smiled. I know you feel that way now, but you're so young. You'll meet someone new, and you'll fall in love with him, and you'll marry him, and have cute little children with him, and you'll have tea with your new mother-in-law on your new back patio, and you'll tell yourself that really you were meant to marry this person, and that my son was was a stepping stone, a little detour, and it will all be okay. It'll be okay. The bride started to cry. But I don't want that. He wasn't a stepping stone. I wanted a life with him, a family with him, with you. I don't want anything else. He wasn't a little detour. The mother-in-law took the bride's hands and held them in her own. Listen, if you want to live any kind of productive life, you're going to have to find a way to let go. You might not be able to for a while, maybe not for a year or two or ten, but you'll have to let go someday. You have that opportunity. I, I, on the other hand, don't have that luxury. A parent can never let go. I'll be stuck with this the rest of my life. But you don't have to be. Don't squander your life in spite, not in the name of my boy, not in the name of my son. Think of what he'd want for you. It's not spite, Marlene. It's, it's the way I see it. The mother-in-law said, you have two ways of looking at this. You can either accept it all as tragedy and doom your time married to my son as a wholly heartbreaking experience, or, or you can be glad you ever got to know my boy at all. You can try to be, at least in some minor sense, grateful you got to be with him, even if it was for a short, short time. I don't want him to be a memory. I don't... I don't want you to not be my mother-in-law anymore, the bride said, breaking down. The mother-in-law laughed softly. Oh, honey, I can always be your mother-in-law. But what if, what if I do get remarried? What then? I can't have two mother-in-laws. What would his family think? Whoa, who said you can't have two mother-in-laws? Who made that rule? I can always be your mother-in-law. Always. She fell into her mother-in-law's arms and cried. I just don't understand, the bride said. I just don't understand. The mother-in-law petted the bride's long, thick hair. Neither do I, sweetie, she whispered. Neither do I. Thank you all for listening. That was episode 27 of the podcast titled A Little Detour. This episode was written, edited, produced, and narrated by myself with the music being by Kevin McLeod. Thank you all so much for listening. (laughs) 